Usually in my temple we don't use bells because we believe in no bell silence. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. And many people on the retreats, because we don't have any bells, you know, they get such deep meditation, you know what, what they win, what prize they win? No bell peace prize. <laughs> so welcome to uh, this evening's talk and meditation, or what else? Questions and answers. So, if you are sitting comfortably, then I will begin. So we're going to do some meditation first of all. Uh, that's okay with anybody. If you don't like to, now's the time to get out while the going is good. So, very simple meditation, uh, sitting down, and I'll give the guidance for the first 20 minutes, or 15 minutes or so, and then uh, uh, we'll be quiet for a few minutes, and then I'll uh, wrap up. Only half an hour meditation. And if you have other ways you've meditated before, most welcome to actually do it your way. So, if you want to try this method, fine. If you want to do another method, fine. So we are not... That's your job. You mean I have to do everything? Can you ring the bell? <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, go on. Yeah, that's your... The, you're the, the bell nun. Whatever. Whenever I talk too much. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, uh, if you'd like to, first of all, close your eyes. And with the eyes closed, bring some awareness onto your posture. How are you sitting right now? Are you comfortable? Or can you make yourself more comfortable by moving this, adjusting that? So you just roughly get into a good position and now we refine our posture by doing some body awareness with some compassion practice. So to start with, can you be aware of the feelings, the sensations, aches, uh, stress, warmth, whatever it is, in your legs, from the toes up to the thighs. How do your legs feel? Do they need to be adjusted? And don't just assume that the legs are in a good position. Experiment, try, move them pull the foot further forward or tuck it more in until you can find the best position for your legs. And it won't be the same for every meditation session. The body does change, so we have to be aware to adapt to the changing uh, positions, the changing states of our body. So, by being aware of the feelings, sensations in the legs, moving them this way, moving them that way, you eventually come to the best position. It's called kindness, compassion, to your own body. Caring for it, looking after it, so it's comfortable. So you won't need to move it later. And then, you move up to your bottom. That bottom, often is a cause for much fidgeting during meditation because it's not comfortable. You're not careful enough and kind enough to adjust your bottom to be as comfortable as you can on the chair, on the cushion, wherever it is. So, adjust the bottom. And every time you adjust, you'll get what we call feedback from your mindfulness. You can remember what it felt like before, now you know what it feels like now. Is it got better or has it got worse? That way, fidgeting eventually stops when you find the best position. And then you move up to your back. How's your back now? 
Now I like the beginning of meditation like this to stretch my back. All animals, including humans, like to stretch. And when they stretch, you get, I feel so nice, you get endorphins going through your bloodstream. Nature's painkillers, very good for health. And then I relax my back. Until I can let it go into the most comfortable position. Sometimes if you're sitting on a chair you can lean back. Sometimes you can have a straight back. It's not always the same, every meditation. You are aware of the comfort level in your back and you find the optimum position for your back. That is compassion. It's not assuming what's right. It's being aware and being kind to find out what is right for you. And then where you put your hands, so many different positions you can put your hands. If I'm meditating, holding a microphone in one hand, then I have a posture for doing uh, guided meditations. But I find what's the best posture. Move my hand this way, move my hand that way until I find the best position. This is compassion, kindness, looking after your own body. But it is also developing the quality of awareness, mindfulness, focused on your own body, out of care for it, and learning how to get the body in the best position. Many people say have back problems because they're totally unaware, unaware of their posture when they're working at their desk, typing on their computer, or even just uh, sleeping. Once you develop the awareness of how your body feels, it's pretty simple to go to the next step and learn how to relax it and bring it to good health. And then, once the back is okay, I've been encouraging people to focus on your shoulders. It seems that many people have stress, tightness in the muscles of their shoulders. To, ma to be able to relax those muscles, we use a bit of awareness on those feelings and a bit of visualization. You can imagine your shoulder muscles to be a bunch of strings. And those strings are being stretched on either end, pulled until they're tight, they're under strain. And on both sides of your shoulders, you imagine the strings being stretched. And now you imagine just letting go of both ends of those strings. Letting them go. If you visualize that, actually the muscles will follow, the real muscles, and the muscles relax. And your awareness, your mindfulness, notices a different feeling which is very easy to recognize as the muscles have relaxed. They're more at ease. So you don't get pain in that area when you're meditating, especially for long periods of time. Your awareness has given you the skill of relaxing your own shoulders. And then you may move up to the throat, <coughs> Thank you whoever coughed, because that's what I was going to talk about. <laughs> Coughing. Sometimes uh, it's natural. People have allergies or just coughs. And so, if you have to cough, please do so. Because if you suppress that cough, if you hold it in, you will find that we have in meditation what we call a volcano effect. A volcano effect is when you decide, no, I'm not going to cough, I'm going to disturb people that way. So you hold it in, you hold it in, you hold it in. It just builds up pressure. And it builds up so much pressure, it's going to blow. And when it does blow, that is a big noise. <coughs> and also, just like a volcano, it spreads all this toxic spray over the people who sit around. 
So that's what I call the volcano effect of meditation. So just cough before it gets really bad. <coughs> wow, so many people coughing now. <laughs> Excellent. But then, if it's not so bad, you can put awareness on that irritation of the throat from where the cough comes from. You feel it, mindful of it. What makes it worse? What makes it ease off? And you'll find that if you try and control the irritation which causes the coughs, if you are afraid of it, you'll find it gets worse. You tense up with the irritation and it gets so bad sometimes, it does end up with a big cough. However, if you feel that irritation and learn how to be kind to it, you find the intensity of the irritation gets less and less and less and less. Just like I learned as a child over in Acton, Whenever I would play soccer, go for a tackle, graze the skin off my knees, I go run to my mother, Mummy, Mummy, I'm bleeding, and in pain too. And all she would do was kneel down and put her lips to the wound and kiss it better. A mouth full of germs on a local wound. Never ever got infected. But more importantly, just a little act of kindness and compassion took all the pain away. I remember that. I just slap a band-aid on and out playing soccer again. Now, that's just like irritations. Give them kindness and they get less. So give kindness to your throat, not controlling. And your mindfulness, which gives you feedback, might notice the irritation gets less and less and less. You're learning a valuable skill of mindfulness and compassion, what I call kindfulness, eases and heals. Then I go out to my head, make sure it's well balanced on top of the neck not too far forward, not too far back, not to the left, not to the right just middle way and especially I just got into the habit of being aware of the muscles around my eyes because if I'm tired or if I'm afraid those muscles tense up they get tight and it's so easy to learn how to relax those muscles. When you're kind, you don't try and worry about anything. You just let things be. You can feel the muscles relax and it's a sensation which is easy to notice. And you keep on relaxing those muscles, the mindfulness giving you feedback until the muscles are totally relaxed. With those relaxed muscles, much of the emotions behind that just get softened. And then before I leave my body to go into the emotional world of the mind, I just look, somewhere in my body there's always something which is irritating. An ache or a pain, stomach ache, some sort of a wound which is aching. There's always something. So I focus on the most irritating, disturbing feeling in my body. Just zoom in on it. So I almost like fill my mind just with that tiny area of my body which isn't feeling good. I'm aware of that sensation, that ache, that pain. Whatever it is, you don't need to give it a name, just be aware of it. And then I give it kindness, opening the door of my heart to that irritation. If it truly is compassion, then that feeling 
the irritating feeling softens, the pain gets less. Because the mindfulness, always looking at that one area, sees what works and what doesn't. Sees the, sees the cause, which gives rise to deep relaxation in that one part of the body. And sees the attitude of mind, which makes things more tense and tight and more inflamed. Always compassion, letting things be, non-judgmental awareness. That's what relaxes everything. I do that on my body first. Until my body feels so deeply relaxed, so at peace, it's a delightful feeling. Train myself to actually be able to notice that delightful feeling and even indulge in it. Because I know from experience what happens is when you are aware of the delightful feeling of a relaxed body, the relaxation goes deeper. Totally at ease and relaxed in this moment with your body. It's not only good for the health, and energy. It's also strengthening these two important qualities of meditation, awareness and kindness. And then I let the body go and I ask myself, how peaceful are you or how agitated? So to get to know what I mean, you may ask yourself, how agitated, or no, how peaceful am I? From one to ten, give a number to yourself. One means extremely peaceful, ten means really agitated. Be honest. It's only you knowing. So how peaceful and how agitated are you? This is a skillful means by which you can know something I call the peaceometer in your mind. Just like a speedometer in a car, a thermometer on the wall which tells you the temperature. This is telling you how peaceful you are or how disturbed. You're aware of that and after a while you become very, very skilled at noticing that quality. You're putting the mindfulness on one of the most important parts of your emotional world. How peaceful, how agitated you are. And as you are mindful, aware of your own peaceometer, what makes that needle go up so you're getting more agitated? What makes that needle go down so you're getting more peaceful? You'll find when you strive, when you want, when you long for something, or you really try to get rid of something, that needle just goes up and up and up, more and more agitated. <coughs> but when you let things be, when you open the door of your heart to this moment, when you abandon all wanting, all expectations, and realize this is good enough, I'm right? just happy to be here. Then you find you get peaceful. You're learning how to be still. Not through wanting or struggling, but by just being. Kindness, present moment, just being here with unconditional awareness. Being aware, not judging. As you do that, you find the peaceometer really moves further and further away from irritation, closer and closer to deep stillness. Really being still. You 
And if you think you are still, notice the delight of a still mind, a peaceful mind. Just no burdens, no worries, free. Just like you used to be when you were a child, playing. No even thoughts of the future. No real memories of the past. In the present moment, at peace and happy. And it may very well be, at this time, you become aware of things like the breathing. The experience of the breath going in and out of your body. It's actually a natural occurrence. So if you are aware of the breath, your breathing now, just be aware of it, but don't control it. Your job is not to tell it what to do. Your job is to be a friend to your breathing. Be a friend, not a control freak. And then you find it stays with you. If you like, you can do the little technique, breathing in peace. And breathe out, let go. Whatever is bothering you, sickness, ill health, weakness, whatever, Breathe that out with every out breath. As you breathe in health, peace, love, freedom, whatever it is you want to breathe in, something positive, let that come in with every in breath. Feel it with every part of an in breath from beginning to end. Breathe out sickness, tension, whatever, with every out breath from beginning to the end. Breathing in peace, breathing out in God. I'm not going to be quiet for a few minutes. Either be aware of the breathing or just be aware of the peace officer.
So it's getting close to the end of this meditation. How do you feel? How's that piece of me? I haven't finished yet, so don't move yet. Just another minute or two. How do you feel? How's your piece of it? How still are you? And why? What actually works? You know what monks like me tell you? But from your own direct experience, what makes that peace of it just really go close to one? What does peace feel like? Stillness. <coughs> Clarity. And how does the body feel when the mind is still? When I take my attention away from the body and get very still in the mind, my body just feels so good, so free, no tightness, tension anywhere to be found. This is how we meditate. I guide you, but you learn for yourself. You know sometimes uh, people in many countries, many places, can't always, can't always get close to a temple or a teacher or whatever. This is our modern world. We know what you can do these days, which I encourage. You can, these things like guided meditation are all recorded. So, you download them on your iPod iPad, iPhone, or I something or other. And once you have downloaded it, any place, any time, whenever you need a guided meditation, you can put the, the earbuds in and listen to the guided meditation. Which is so useful because we don't always have the time to come to the temple or to a monastery or to a retreat center where the teachings are on. So you can actually get it free on your iPad, iPod, and listen to it any time you need it as a resource for you. When you're sick, when you're waiting for a doctor's appointment, or whatever, you need to relax. Because sometimes it's hard, unless you've been practicing a while, to do it for yourself. When you've got your teacher in there, like in your ear, giving you these instructions, then it's there for you. Whenever you need, you sort of turn it on, and it's when your eyes close. It's not that much different than actually having a teacher in front of you. So the teacher is there with you in your car, in your um, home, on the aircraft, whenever you need it, even on the toilet. So it's not disrespectful if it's what you need at that time. So the Buddha will go everywhere with you. And I'm very happy to go with you on the toilet bowl. <laughs> Not physically, <laughs> but all the recordings. That's why when I was in the United States a couple of months ago, I realized that's what they call you know, the, the toilets, the restrooms. To take a rest. So it can't be just for sort of doing your business. That's why I also tell people, if you haven't, if you're really busy at work, and you can't find the time to do some meditation, you can't find a place to do meditation. That's what the restrooms are there for, to take a rest. So you can go there, lock yourselves in, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, however long you need. And if other people say, what were you doing there for 20 minutes? Such a long time. The answer is obvious, you were constipated. <laughs> <laughs> it's not lying, it's just another way of saying what happens when your mind is stuffed up and doesn't flow freely. We don't know how to let go. <laughs> so that's true. So anyway, that's how we can make use of the meditation. Now, uh, the topic of the talk is supposed to be dealing with uncertainty, making peace with uncertainty. 
Now already, oh, I don't think I have said this yet, that this part of the meditation, which I always say, whatever you're aware of, just make peace with it, be kind, be gentle. Make peace, be kind, be gentle. With whatever you are experiencing in life. Because you know, sometimes people used to tell me, well, it's okay to meditate when I'm feeling good, when I'm not sick, when I'm not having some fever. You know, then I can meditate, but you know, sometimes you know, you're sick, you know, sometimes you're going through some operation, or you feel terrible. Well, how do I meditate then? Can't even cross my legs, it hurts. And I said, look, you don't know what meditation is if you think you have to be watching your breath or visualizing something. Because the heart of meditation is no matter what you're experiencing, no matter what that is, just make peace with it. Don't fight it, don't make war, trying to get rid of stuff. Make peace with it. So I remember when people said, I think they had uh, some fever or whatever, a flu or whatever, can you make peace with that flu, that feeling, that tiredness? Can you make peace with it? Of course you can. You can make peace with anything. Can you be kind to it, care for it? Of course you can. Can you be gentle? Of course you can. This is basic Buddhism, all traditions. Compassion, peace, kindness. But if you make war with your body, with your mind, you know what happens? What George W. Bush used to call collateral damage. You hurt things. But when you make peace, be kind, be gentle. It's called good karma. Good meditation karma. You make peace, be kind, be gentle. Now, the results are you have peace, you have freedom, you have joy afterwards. But if you try and fight the body, fight the, the sickness, that is making bad meditation karma. And you're going to get trouble afterwards. So actually you can meditate any place, any time, in any condition, whatever you're feeling, if you know how to do it. Make peace, be kind, be gentle. And for those of you who haven't heard me before, that is the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. So, that is how we can meditate anywhere, anytime. And in particular, with anything in life, to make peace with it. Sometimes, you know, it's very frightening life, the uncertainties of life. You have cancer, you're losing all your money, your relationship is breaking down, your temple is burning, you can't pay the bills. Ah, what should I do? And I like to use stories, anecdotes from my own life to illustrate you know, how these actually work. How you can make peace with anything, with really fear, uncertainty and how. The results are really unexpected and usually entirely positive. And that was the anecdote. I was a school teacher once before I became a monk in a high school in Devon. Yeah, it was a beautiful part of the world, but kids being kids, teenagers being teenagers, after one year of teaching teenagers in a high school, that was it, time to leave the world. I'd had enough. <laughs> it really stressful and hard work. But, obviously there's many, many experiences you have which you know, teach you life lessons, and one of those experiences was when the English teacher, the head of the English department in this school in Devon, was just chatting and he said that he was in the British Army during the Second World War. You know, didn't really want to be a soldier, but everyone had to volunteer. And he was in Burma, in the jungles, fighting Japanese. You know, not, he wasn't serious, but you know, that's what he had to do. So there he was on patrol with a few other soldiers. They had a scout, and the scout came back and said, we're in big trouble, because they had wandered into a huge number of enemy soldiers. And the scout said they were completely surrounded, there was no way out, and really heavily outnumbered. This was war. And he thought, this is his end. He's going to die thousands of miles from his home, 
fighting a war which he just had to achieve, you know, really wasn't, uh, didn't want to do. And they're about to die, surrounded by so many soldiers, and only a few of them know we have. But, he told me, and I think I believe this, that sometimes no one knows who's going to be the hero. And he had this surge of heroism, and he said, let's fight our way out. It's better than just sitting here waiting to be shot and killed. <coughs> let's fight our way out, who knows? Someone might escape. And if we don't, at least we can take some of the enemy with us into death. That's the, the die-hard school of getting out of difficult situations. Might work in Hollywood, but it doesn't work in real life. So he wanted to fight his way out. But his captain was far wiser. He said, no, we will not fight. Put down your weapons. Instead, we will all have a cup of tea. It was the British Army. <laughs> <laughs> and you may laugh at that, but that was one of the wisest things which he ever did. It saved his life. It was orders at war in an army. You had to follow them, no matter how crazy they seemed at the time. Sometimes that people think, no, it's, well, work is crazy. But sometimes we don't appreciate the skillful means which has been developed in the British Army over many centuries. We've been trying to sit down and have a cup of tea. We don't like tea, have a coffee. If you don't like coffee, have some, some apple juice or whatever. But what they did, they had to do that. And in the time it took them to just make a cup of tea, not even finish it yet, the scout came back and said, put away everything quickly, silently. The enemy has moved. There's a way through. Let's go for it. And of course, he escaped without any injury. So did every one of those soldiers. When they were surrounded with death impending, the worst possible thing, instead of panicking, when there was nothing to do, they did nothing. Simple, logical, but a lot of times people just cannot do that. And they waited. They waited in the knowledge that everything is uncertain, it's impermanent, it changes. It will never be the same from one moment to the next. Let us wait until there is an opportunity where we can do something positive. And that's what they did. That's how to make peace with uncertainty. Wait, knowing things are always changing in flux. And instead of wasting your life, your energy or whatever, fighting a battle which you cannot win, which is going to harm you and others, you wait, you pause. Knowing that later on it will not be the same and you can take your chances and have a much better chance of actually getting through the difficult times. So he told me he owed his life to that captain, or the wisdom, not just once but many times. He told me that once he had cancer, inoperable, uh, terminal, no opportunity, no possibility of getting better. And what did he do? Sat down and had a cup of tea. Can't fight it, so just let it be. And because he didn't fight it, get more tense, you know, with the, the uh, impending death, he started to get better. And he eventually got through to remission. He survived. And he often told me that if he tried to fight his cancer, do battle with it, he'd probably be dead. It was a stress-caused disease, and you had more stress to it, and obviously it gets worse. So those were the sorts of ideas which he was telling me which actually work in real life, which is how we deal with uncertainty. We turn it to our advantage. Life is uncertain. So, go with the uncertainty rather than trying to, rather than trying to force the flow of life 
according to our will, according to our plans. We never know what's going to happen next. And quite honestly, I never plan my talks. <laughs> Even earlier, I think, Venerable Chanda asked me, you know, do you remember what you're going to talk about tonight? And I, actually, he had to remind me a few minutes before. So every time, yeah. So I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Sometimes you have the title of the talk and I talk about something completely different. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a student, a great fan of Monty Python, and now for something completely different. <laughs> it's uncertain. And it's much more fun that way. If you have a book, do you go straight to the ending first of all and find out the ending, who did it? Of course not. Otherwise it'd be just so boring and just predictable. Life is uncertain, you're uncertain, I'm uncertain, and I celebrate that. I don't, I don't try and even make peace with it. I love it. It's life. Joyful. When you don't know whatever is going to happen next. Otherwise life is dead. Predictable. Fated. Destined. What sort of life is that? If my life was destined from the beginning and I can't do anything about it. I might as well just go to bed and go to sleep. What's the point of any effort? It's going to happen anyway. But, you know that that's not what, what life is. It is uncertain, which means there's something you can always do. For example, there was a, a lady who came on my first talk uh, in Chiswick and she had a it was her daughter who was, I'm not quite sure what the condition was, was in a wheelchair and was very hard to actually to talk to. And, you know, it was, she said, was this the karmic result of something bad she did in her life, having to live like this? And of course, as a traditional Buddhist, I said, absolutely not. And I told her the simile of the law of karma, which actually shows you know, what we're actually doing here. And the uncertainty of life gives us opportunities. So I said the simile of baking a cake. Two people have two different sets of ingredients. One has really amazing ingredients. The very, very best whole wheat flour, organically grown, free-range wheat, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> we know what I'm talking about. With no free trade, with no sort of genetically modified crops within a thousand miles of the field, and <laughs> no packaged in uh, in paper from um, a forest certified as, re as what was it, re re not recyclable, <laughs> resuscitatable. <I don't> know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sorry? Sustainable. Sustainable, yeah, thank you. Quite <laughs> a busy day. But it makes, it doesn't make much more fun when you make mistakes like that. <laughs> Sustainable forest. And, the very best you could possibly get. And they got this, and not sugar, but honey from Australia. I've got to justify to my government why I come over here. So I'm, I'm <laughs> advertising the amazing honey from my state. And they have fruit, amazing uh, fruit from the Portugal you live. But from Portugal, that's where Helen comes from. So I'm her friend now. <laughs> and what else do you need for fruit? Um, eggs. 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 Salmonella free eggs from the UK. <laughs> I actually read that. So it's actually salmonella free eggs now when I was at my cousin's. So, the very best ingredients. And because uh, I know there's a few people from Poland here 
And there is a modern kitchen. They're from the best designers, the kitchen manufacturers in Poland. <laughs> so they've got the very, 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 very best. And the other person's got the very worst ingredients. They have got um, genetically modified flour <laughs> with lots of pesticides. <coughs> they have, we say time, get out somewhere. And they've got diabetically enriched sugar, <laughs> cholest cholesterol enhanced margarine or something, full of chemicals. And what's the other one they've got in? Oh, they've got, yeah, that's. Uh, sorry? Fruit, yeah. They've, <laughs> they've got Frankenstein fruit, which is so old that it's so hard that the British Army could use them instead of bullets. <laughs> so hard. And they've got this pre World War kitchen to cook it in. That's the first World War, not the second World War kitchen. Really old. Who makes the best cake? And it's not always a person with the best ingredients, is it? Because just the ingredients you've got to work with in life, that's you know, helpful. But the most important part in cooking is the love and care, the energy, the patience which you put into those cooking. And I tell that story a lot, but when I was in Singapore once, in the Singapore Straits Times, they reported that Jamie Oliver, or somebody like that, was in Singapore and they had a little competition with the street hawkers. The food just you know, sold in, in food courts and stuff on the streets. They asked them to cook something and Jamie Oliver to cook something. He could get his own ingredients. They had to, you know, whatever they could afford. And they had the general public who didn't know who this, this white fellow was cooking. The general public would compare the same food who made the most delicious dim sum or something. And it was the street hawkers would always win. Why? Because if you go to that part of Asia, the competition is so cutthroat, so so tough, that to survive you have to really put so much energy and effort and love and care and skill into what you're doing. Jamie Oliver, he just, he can do anything and still gets paid a fortune. But it's not what the skill you have and the ingredients, it's what you do with them. So that is the uncertainty principle. That the ingredients you have in life, you know, where you come from, your intelligence, your skills, your health, your uh, status in life, your finances, your physical strength or your disabilities. That's not what a disability is. You're disabled if you don't know how to make use of what you have. And you know, sometimes in my life I've met what some people call disabled and I call, wow, you have made so much with what you have that you are richer than I am. For example, when I was in, in Cambridge University, this is, I, I own up to this, I was a Buddhist, you know, when I was only 16, and so that I was a Buddhist when I was in college, and everybody knew that. I had a couple of friends who were Christians, and you know, we were discussing things together. And one day they came to me and said, we're going to Fullborn Hospital to do some voluntary work in the occupational therapy ward uh, with people with Down syndrome. And I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? The Christians are going, I'd better go too. <laughs> and it was not compassion. It was not self-sacrificing, it was just conceit. If the Christians can do it, I'd better do it too. Keeping up with the Joneses. Honestly, that was my idea at the time. Not very, not very praiseworthy, but that's actually how it began. So when I went 
to do my social service, keep the flag flying for the Dhamma, you know, not being outdone by the other side. So when I did go in there, I was so amazingly surprised. I so much enjoyed going there every Thursday afternoon. Long after the Christians left, I kept going for a couple of years. Every, and as he had told me, of all the students I'd ever known, I was the most regular, who went there the most. And I told him, why, look, what are you talking about? I look forward to this, every Thursday afternoon. I was living with conceited students, I was one of them, and with professors who thought they were so smart. But these people were supposed to be disabled. They were some of the most intelligent people I'd ever met. Emotional intelligence. I didn't know that word then. But you know, sometimes you can hang out with noble lawyers in the college system. And I could also hang out with some of these people who were said to be disabled, Down syndrome. But the ones I would prefer to hang out with were the real Down syndrome. And it happened, I remember, that I just had an argument split up with the girlfriend the night before. You know, you're just a young man, you're just really bleh, depressed, down in the dumps, grumpy. And these Down syndrome um, people, geniuses I should have said, they would see me straight away and immediately suss me out and come running towards me and give me a big hug. I said, how do you know that? They were emotionally so sensitive and incredible just you know, what they did and how effective that was. And if I have any skills as a man, as a monk with emotional intelligence, they were my gurus, they were my teachers, they were my masters. I remember them. Because they taught me so much. So were they disabled? Other people might say so. Maybe um, not treated fairly, but they had so much to say and so much to teach. So, no, I wouldn't say they were disabled. They should be everyone included in. You can learn so much, share so much. It's arrogant to think they're disabled and we are not. So actually, quite frankly, I think professors, especially of things like philosophy, and Nobel Prize laureates, I think they should have access to the disabled car parking base. <laughs> <laughs> One of my friends in Malaysia just finished his PhD in psychology. He said, what PhD means? Permanent head damage. <laughs> <laughs> Please excuse me, there's a few doctors in here, or PhDs for sure. But, what he was doing is the uncertainty. I was allowing myself to actually, all that I've been taught and led to believe and brainwashed, I was actually challenging it. It was uncertain. Maybe it wasn't true. And I was learning to actually to see things in a different way. So what, to me, maybe you thought was a tragedy, turned out to be actually a blessing, a benefit. It was uncertain. And so, if you don't know just you know, where um, emotional intelligence is, where other things are, my goodness, life is so uncertain. We don't make peace with uncertainty, we actually celebrate uncertainty. We enjoy it. It gives us so many opportunities to see things in a different way challenge old perceptions and learn to be wise and kind in a way we never ever thought. Look at me. I just work, I just work my butt off traveling all over the place serving other people. And sometimes you know if you look at the amount of things which I do and sacrifice and work which I don't really need to do, some point people say I've got many many friends from Wajrayana from Mahayana, and they say, Ajahn Brahm, you're more Bodhisattva than I am. Well, I'm Hinayana, I'm Theravada. They said, yeah, but... <laughs> they call me, some of my Mahayana monks say, you're a Theravada on the outside, with a Mahayana heart inside. 
I thought that was actually quite, quite nice. But what it really, I don't care which, you know my tradition anyway, most of you. My tradition is, I try to combine things. So, you know the three traditions, the three vehicles, Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana. So, combine them, but what can you call it? So, I can take the H from Hinayana, the Aha from Mahayana, and the last word, the Yana from Vajrayana. And what does that spell? Hahayana. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you're Hahayana too, you laugh. So when they ask what my uh, tradition is, Hahayana. What about my name, Ajahn Brahm? You know what that means, Brahm? B for Buddhist, R for Roman Catholic, A for Anglican, H for Hindu, and M for Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do that for? Uncertain. Can you actually pin a person down who they are? what they are. If you do, for example, do you know your partner? Do you know them? You may have lived with them for so many years. Do you really know them? If you do, your relationship is dead. It's like you read the book, you know the ending. <laughs> do you keep reading that book? Or you take it back to the library or give it to somebody else? <laughs> <laughs> What are you doing with the book, isn't it? <laughs> How many times do you have to see the movie before you're fed up with you know, seeing it again? It's amazing that you don't even know yourself. How can you know your partner? A few days ago, actually just about maybe two weeks ago now, oh, no, ten days, I decided, because I'm 66 now, to actually to apply for, well, this is Australian, uh, Commonwealth Seniors Cup. I don't know if I get any extra benefits because as a terrified of mark, I get meals on wheels every day. <laughs> you know, all the devotees, they come with big food from town to our monastery in their cars. It's called Meals on Wheels. <laughs> I won't get a pension anyway. You don't need it. Don't do money as terrified of Buddhist monks. So what benefits do you get getting a seniors card? You get into the movies or cut price. Can't go to the movies. So what benefits do you get? And I thought, well, you know, I might get a bit of respect. Pretty love seeing you. <laughs> but I just did it. So it's, you know, I had the form there, so instead of um, getting rid of the form, I might as well use it. But the trouble was, I had to go to the office. I'm not sure what they call it in the UK, they call it Centenic, Social Security, whatever. It's the same as the Dole Office, the same place. And so I went there, and they said, well, I, we need ID first of all. You need to prove who you are. And as soon as they said that, I started contemplating. You mean I have to prove who I am? For 43 years I haven't found the answer to that question. <laughs> This is going to be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, well at least there's an identification. Oh, I mean, what, what do you have to get? Passport? I actually had that. in my passport. But then you need more identification. We need your driving license. So I haven't got a driving license. Although well, we don't drive cars. And there's a good reason for that. I remember actually somebody showed me the advertisement from Mercedes car. They had a, a Tibetan monk driving, he was going all over the road. <laughs> you know, if you didn't know what he was up to, you'd think he was drunk, swerving this way, swerving that way. And he was, he was avoiding the bucks on the road. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why Buddhist monks and nuns can't drive. You know, they go this way and that way, that way and this way. <laughs> to avoid destroying life. <laughs> But anyway, so I haven't got a driving license, so your bank card. I haven't got a bank card. I don't have a bank account. Well, what about your marriage license? That <laughs> can't <of> fit. <laughs> what about this? Then what about your rental agreement? We don't have rent. You know, the, the mortgage agreement? We don't have that. And what else do 
the gospel. Um, I think they asked me so much. And I said, we don't have that. You know, monks don't get married, we don't have bank accounts, we don't have driving licenses. They said, well, it's like you don't exist. I said, yes, that's the answer. <laughs> I don't know in this place here, in this uh, temple, but in our monastery, so many monks that we have to have, like, we do like a buffet service, we put all the food on tables, have it offered, and then the monks go in line, the monks go in line, like a buffet. But we always have to have two lines in a Buddhist monastery. Two lines. We have those who are enlightened and those who aren't. Because those who are not enlightened have to do self-service and those who are enlightened do no self-service. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm always a bit concerned when people want photographs and they say, can I do a selfie? I say, no you can't. You can do a no selfie. <laughs> The uncertainty in our, of our life, I celebrate that. Which means you see someone and you don't know who they are. And you allow them to be different than your expectations. You can look at someone and say, I don't know you. It's wonderful I don't know you. I celebrate that because you're unpredictable. You know sometimes if you look at someone and you've had problems with them before, that you expect sort of to get angry. But if you look at them, people who <coughs> you thought were terrible, awful people, you look at them, forgetting the past anger and hurt which you have had at their hands or by their speech, you look at them and say, I don't know what you're going to do today. It gives the opportunity, the space, for them to surprise you. Terrible people can be good. And good people can make mistakes. You can't put people in a box. They're uncertain. But that's wonderful that they are. It's nice being unpredictable. Unfortunately, my unpredictable, unpredictability is pretty predictable these days. When I came in here, I was hiding at the back. <laughs> Just for fun. You know, it's <laughs> sometimes it's nice, it's fun, you know, to do things differently. Uh, this one story, <laughs> you know, just be uncertain, who, who are you? So this one time I remember I was helping the other monks do some building work. Getting myself dirty, shoveling concrete. I love concrete trucks. I've got a fetish about cement. <laughs> I'm a boy, okay? You like to get dirty, you like to get in there and shovel and build and get all, all cement marks all over your face. <laughs> so I was just indulging, helping, it needed to be done anyway, so helping with the other uh, monks, even though at that time I was really senior. And when we finished, I was walking back from the building site to my hut to get a shower and to change my robes to something a bit more um, respectable. Because they were all sort of in the work clothes, they were just all sort of dirty and stained. So anyway, as I was walking to the shower, uh, a, it was a Sri nothing to against Sri Lankans, it was a Sri Lankan girl who was a very high class Sri Lankan lady because she was obviously wearing a very expensive sari and so many bangles on her wrist that when I heard her coming from a distance, I thought it was the ice cream truck. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounded like. <laughs> and so I couldn't avoid her. She was coming past me, and so she stopped me and said, oh, 
Um, I'm looking for uh, Ajahn Brahm. And thinking very quickly, I said, well, I'll, he's probably, you probably see him in the, in the, the room <laughs> over there in about 15 minutes. He's going to be there? Yeah, probably. And so off she went. And I had a shower, changed my robes. I went to see her. And you know, she, she didn't recognize me? <laughs> Not at all, because I you know, talked a bit Dharma, Buddhism, meditation, what we were doing. And she was really impressed. So she said, wow, you know, there's a wonderful teaching, really good monk, wonderful monastery. But if you don't mind me saying, there's one thing I thought I should be to your attention. On my way here, I saw one of your monks who was very badly dressed and dirty. That's not appropriate for a monk to look like that. You know, you should tell your monks that they have much better dress and be more clean and more respectable. If you don't mind me saying that, a tiny criticism. I said, you saw a monk like that here? Wow. Okay, madam, I will speak to him later about it. <laughs> That's not like I often speak to myself. <laughs> but it's wonderful playing different roles. Because <laughs> it's actually, I don't know why, why people just keep taking photographs of me. <laughs> Honestly, when I was in Indonesia, I was told that the Buddhist monument, Bodh Budur, in the central Java, is incredible, beautiful, full stupas. That so many people were taking flash photographs of that wonderful monument, they had to ban it because the flashlight was actually degrading the stonework. Same thing's happening to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what I'm going to look like you know, next time I go to Indonesia, all degraded. <laughs> but, so celebrating uncertainty, you never know what's going to happen next. Never once, when I first became a monk, I thought I was going to you know, go off into a nice forest, <coughs> a nice cave, and just disappear from the world and live happily ever after. Just vanish. And I get up to such crazy things these days. The next crazy thing I'm going to do, totally uncertain, I never in my wildest dreams thought I was ever going to do something like this. Though we're having a debate in Cambridge on Thursday the 9th of November. Uh, and it's like a debate in this Cambridge Union Debating Society. His holders the Dalai Lama has been there. But they're having a debate on, they have a motion, a proposition. This house has lost faith in faith. And they wanted me to speak for the motion. And I'm a monk, I'm a religious person. I would actually argue that we've lost faith in faith. And my adversary, the one I'm arguing against, betting against, is Russell Brand. <laughs> and he's arguing for faith. <laughs> it's really weird, isn't it? Totally crazy, but I like crazy stuff. <laughs> totally uncertain. And just celebrating the uncertainty of what you have to do as a Buddhist monk in a modern world. <laughs> in other words, I would just all my uncertainty. You just go with it. And he's had the greatest of fun. There's one fellow who came to our meditation class and he was a radio producer. And he was in a local radio station. They do these, these late night talkback shows. So he said, oh, you know, you can think on your feet. You can give some strange answers. Can I get you to come on my radio show, talkback? I said, yeah, sure, you know, but I'm really busy. But I really wanted to do that. I've never done that before, like talkback radio. So let's give it a try. After 43 years as a monk, you know, you just, you know, you get bored with the normal stuff. So, you know, do something a bit more interesting. Why not? You know, your experience a bit. This also gives you wonderful stories to talk you know, at this centre afterwards. It gives you material which makes people interesting. So anyway, I no time it comes after the usual talk I used to give on a Friday night. So I arrived at the studio at 10 p.m. and on Friday night and it was really late and you know I just got into the studio. I had to rush into the studio. If you've ever been on radio 
you got the microphone in front of you, you put your headphones on, the red light goes on, you haven't got time to be introduced. I just made it with seconds to spare. So I was sitting down relaxing, and the, uh, the presenter of the program, welcome this evening to our listeners, and today we have uh, two special guests, and the first special guest is uh, Professor Gabriel Morrissey, who has written so many best-selling books on sexual dysfunction and adult <laughs> problems. <laughs> and that's also, what, what program have I got myself into? <laughs> Am I in the right studio? But it was too late, I had headphones on, and the microphone was in front of me live, the red light was flashing, recording live. And then they asked me my name, Ajahn Brahm. They can't pronounce that. I went to one uh, girls' school once, and then I saw some of the girls from that school, a high school in Perth, the next couple of days. And they came up to say, Ah, oh, thanks for coming to our school yesterday. I said, Oh, you know, you remember me? I said, Oh, yes, we'll never forget a monk called Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> With an M on the end, please, M on the end, not Ra, Ra, <laughs> They're just winding me up having fun. So I enjoyed it, told everyone about it. <laughs> but they couldn't pronounce that, so they called me Mr. Monk. <laughs> Mr. Monk. So here's Mr. Monk from the monastery just now down in the hills, and also Dr. Gabriel Morrissey. So there I was, by that time, celibate for over 30 years, having to field questions from the general public <laughs> about stuff I knew nothing about. <laughs> that has never stopped me. It didn't stop me then, it doesn't stop me now. <laughs> but the weird thing was, you know, because you know you knew psychology done with human beings, the the question the answers which I was giving were actually no, they were so good, they had to be so good because People were ringing from the general public and they'd ask me. And the, this expert, this professor, no one was asking her anything. She was just sitting there, just no, no work to do. At the end of the, the session, two hours, she got the check, I just got a bar of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and that was really mean. <laughs> That's what monks are like. I said, well, I'll just give them a cup of tea, bar of chocolate, don't do anything. <laughs> Very cheap. <laughs> so, so anyway, it was totally uncertain. But I always remember one of the questions which came in from a taxi driver. And just you know why, you know, when you allow uncertainty and just you know, go with it, when you don't know what you're supposed to say, you haven't been trained. You don't allow that learning to stand in the way of truth. The taxi driver just rang up. And he said, oh, Mr. Monk, I'm married, the taxi driver late at night, between fares, I'm married, I'm having an affair with someone else. Is that okay? That was his question. Is that all right? And so straight away, I replied, sir, if it was all right, you would not be ringing me up to ask. And he hung up. <laughs> I got him straight away. I nailed him. <laughs> because that's why he was ringing up. If it was all right, why would he need to ask an expert? He felt guilty. and He wanted somebody else, some authority, to make him feel good, to take away his obvious feeling that he was really doing something hurtful for his wife. That's obvious. So sometimes that when you don't know what you're supposed to say, and you just react in the moment. You actually get it straight away. That's why I like uncertainty. Being put on the spot, no preparation, you do to do a far better job. Many doctors, professors, people who are put in a difficult situation for which they've never been really prepared, they put aside their knowledge and they go for uncertainty and they feel what needs to be done. And that feeling with uncertainty is far more reliable. 
you come up with solutions, with actions, which are really intuitive, original and effective. My master Ajahn Shah was always totally unpredictable. So uncertain that it was great seeing how this un totally unpredictable monk will deal with really difficult crises. And one story which shows that how he dealt with uncertainty, not being trained, and how beautiful and amusing it was. We had a couple of villagers come early in the morning to see him. There was a lady in the village who had been possessed by some demon. And they were very, very violent demon. And this woman was being brought to see the great teacher Ajahn Chah. Maybe Ajahn Chah could fix it. And I was there at the time and that you could hear the woman being dragged into the monastery. She was shouting obscenities. Now what sort of you know, respectable uh, Buddhist would never ever do in the presence of a temple, especially with a holy monk like Ajahn Chah, saying terrible things. And you may notice how tough farmers are. There's a Thai farmers, about four or five of them were needed to, to hold her down, to drag her to see Ajahn Chah. When a person is so psychotic, they have a huge strength. And so, as soon as Ajahn Chah saw that, he told a couple of novice monks, Dig a hole! Dig a hole! I need a big hole dug! And you, boil some water! I need lots and lots and lots of boiling water! I had no idea what Ajahn Chah was up to. Are you, are you totally unpredictable, totally uncertain. You know, there's a crazy person there. What are you digging the hole and boiling water for? And as they brought her closely, you could see her, her big eyes, foaming at the mouth, incredible strength, you know, a shouting obscenities at Ajahn Chah. And all Ajahn Chah did, dig a bigger hole, I need a big hole, and I need lots and lots and lots of boiling water, more boiling water, come on, I need it fast. And again, no one knew what he was up to, until he said, that demon inside that woman is very, very dangerous. The only thing to be able to do is to throw that woman into that hole, pour all the boiling water over her and bury her. That's the only way we can deal with such a dangerous demon. <laughs> That's what he said. Totally unpredictable, this monk. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've known that monk for a long time at that, that occasion. And uh, even I thought he may actually do that. <laughs> but more importantly, that woman thought he will do that. <laughs> and what happened next was just so amazing. Because that woman knew if she didn't get her act together fast, she'd be in that hole with boiling water poured all over her and then buried alive. She calmed down. In one or two minutes, she was sitting there, exhausted, but totally still and peaceful. And Ajahn Chah gave her a blessing, and she walked away. That was just so unpredictable, so amazing to see how a person, you know, with no training, but incredible psychology, knew that underneath that possession, or whatever it was, or that psychosis, was a more powerful force of self-preservation, fear, of pain, and managed to leverage that, so she had to get her act together, she had to calm down, or something terrible would happen to her, and that's what she did. Beautiful to see that. You can't imitate that, if you do that, you go to jail. <laughs> But he could do that because he dealt with incredible uncertainty. Your life. I never thought I'd ever be uh, going to, to teach at the 2015 World Computer Conference over a couple of years ago to give all these weird talks and to actually to make something out of it. Never thought I'd be giving so much. I thought I'd be retiring now. I'm over 60. 65 is supposed to retire 
in Australia. But I found out that monks, that monks don't retire at all. That you're not really a holy man until you're at least 70. <laughs> Life begins at 70 for a Buddhist monk. <laughs> and man, so I don't think you're going to retire. If I can't get away with it, I don't see why you should. <laughs> So that uncertainty, making peace with it now, celebrate it. It tests you, it makes life alive, you never know what's going to happen next. But never sort of be, be um, overwhelmed by uncertainty. It's an opportunity, it's a growth, it's a learning. Accept it. If everything was certain again, you would be dead, there'd be no life, there'd be no learning. If you knew the answer to the exam the night before you took the exam, what's the point? So you never know what's happening next. Which means the future is there for you to make. You have ingredients. What are you going to make with them? That uncertainty means you never need to get depressed, to get negative. To feel you want to blame someone, get angry at someone. Because whatever it is, the ingredients of your life, there's always something positive you can do with it. The future is uncertain. You don't know which way it's going to go. When I was young, we always thought there'd be a nuclear war between Soviet Union and Reagan's America. Never happened. Who knows what's going to happen next? The future is in your hands. Karma, you're creating it. You can do anything. <coughs> Uncertainty is another word for opportunity. Another call for you to get your bums off the seat and do something. Actually, this is often, this is Thich Nhat Hanh used to say, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a time when you actually do something. Why not? So it's amazing. In uncertainty, you don't know what's going to happen next. So if a doctor ever comes up to you and says, you're going to die soon, you've got a bone cancer, I know so many examples of people that are supposed to be dead, they're still alive, they're supposed to have died 20 years ago. The doctor said only got a couple of months to live. One of the best stories. Totally, totally um, uh, against what people think. I like, I like being a rebel. Challenging people's ideas of what should be. And that's a scientist, okay. So, Ted from Yorkshire. No, oh, sorry, I've got this wrong. Ted from Lancashire. I said this yesterday. Ted from Lancashire. You know, he was a smoker. And then he got lung cancer eventually. You can't blame anything because everybody smoked in those days. He got lung cancer, so he went into our hospice in Australia to die. You know, hospices are where you go, palliative care, make the dying as peaceful, as comfortable as possible. So, he told me, I went to visit him after the first day, and he said the night before, the nurse had said, Ted, what do you want for dinner tonight? So Ted said, well, I've got high cholesterol, so I can't have anything oily. I've got hard arteries, so cut out the salt. I've got diabetes, so no sugar, nothing sweet. And the nurse looked at him and said, Ted, you're not going to die of a heart attack or a stroke from cholesterol. You're not going to die because of hard arteries. Diabetes is not going to get you. Cancer is within a few days. So you can eat whatever you like. And his eyes went wide. You mean? I can eat all my favourite greasy, oily food with lots of sugar and syrup and heaps of salt? <laughs> yes. <coughs> so all the food which his wife wouldn't let him eat for the past three years, he ordered in excess. And, about a week later, Ted walked out of that hospice 
The cancer had decreased so much, he had another six months of life before he went into the hospice, hospice and died probably that time. <laughs> Especially the after, you know, you maybe finish work today, when I go uh, back to have a rest tonight, I always remember, never do today what you can put off till tomorrow, <laughs> because you might die tonight. <laughs> Imagine that. You know, you go home this evening, and decide, no, you've got to you know, wash all the dishes, clean up the house, do all that extra work, and you find out you die tonight. All that for nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> What a waste of an evening. <laughs> That's going to happen one day. Anyway. Yeah, sometimes you do something, but the goals, it doesn't matter, you know, winning or losing. That's one of the reasons why I know the, the English soccer team has only just scraped into the World Cup, the finals, whatever it is. But for goodness sake, never get a Buddhist on your soccer team. If you find out they're a Buddhist, don't put them in the first team. Don't who's the, who's the, the, the coach, the manager? You don't play soccer. Anyway, whoever it is, tell them no Buddhists otherwise, because what happens if you have a Buddhist on a soccer team? They have no goals, they don't know where to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> they have compassion. So the last thing they want to do, you know, as Bodhisattvas, is upset the other team. They have letting go. If the other team wants a ball, take it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, before the the Bikuni Monastery, yeah. So half the time I do that, the other half the time I do nothing. So when is the time to do something? This is one of Ajahn Chah's great teachings. He said, if you are meditating, give meditation everything you've got. Forget about work, forget about family, cancer, whatever problem. Meditate. Total focus. When you go to work, you're not meditating or discussing Dharma when you're at work. You get sacked by the boss. When you're at work, 100% everything for working. When you're with your family, the family is the most important thing. 
give 100% to your family. When it's time to rest, 100% for resting. Whatever you do in life, you give it everything you've got. And he's told that to a person in Sydney, and it was so successful, he became very successful in business, wonderful family, great meditator. Whatever he did, in the moment, right now, give it everything you've got. When you're walking home or catching a train, give that everything you've got. You don't sort of, you know, go walking onto the platform thinking about sort of letting go or life is uncertain or whatever. You know, just look out for the traffic, look out for the people. And also, whenever you go out from here and you pass the donation box for Anukampa Bikuni project, give it everything you want. <laughs> Okay, so that's what we do. When it's time to let go, let go of things you've got. Yes? Yeah, you, you spoke about celebrating uncertainty. Yes. And every day, the dukkha we're going to face is uncertain. So would you say what you're saying is commenced with the idea you can celebrate the challenge <coughs> facing dukkha. So the answer to uh, how we encounter dukkha is, is not to abate desire, but to challenge desire to celebrate the ability to, to, to face, yeah. enjoy, celebrate the You are to understand, explore suffering. Why? Where does it come from? Craving. Why? So, to try and overcome it, get rid of it, makes it bigger, makes it worse. So the uncertainty aspect of life gives us opportunities yeah, they do challenge us as well. So we don't look at them as being sort of negative. We don't allow it to cause us fear. And the old story, Winnie the Pooh and Piglet, a great source of philosophy. They must have both been Buddhists. That's why especially Winnie the Pooh was one of my heroes. He was the one who actually taught me bear awareness. <laughs> yeah, have you heard of bear awareness before? That's a Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> so, he was walking with Piglet in the forest. There was a very, very uh, violent storm. Trees were coming, uh, going, coming down around them. And so his uncertainty turned to fear. So little Piglet, small guy, and he grabbed Winnie the Pooh's paw, squeezed it so tightly that Winnie the Pooh had to stop walking, and Piglet screamed out, I'm so afraid! What would happen if a tree fell when we were underneath it? That was the uncertainty of walking through a forest during a storm. And the answer was, from Winnie the Pooh, yes, but what would happen if a tree didn't fall when we were underneath it? The uncertainty. Why do we always <coughs> look at uncertainty with a negative mind? What would happen if? What would we can't we say what would happen if it didn't? And a lot of times, looking at uncertainty with negative mind is what causes the worst to happen. We bring it about, we create what we're afraid of. So that's one way of dealing with uncertainty. It's a challenge, it's interesting, it pushes our learning, we grow more, and it also is something which you know, should be embraced, and I say yes, yeah, celebrated. Desire is a desire to control, to make everything go according to our plans. That's, for me, that's death. Uncertainty opens so many opportunities. We can make the future, we can create it, only if there's uncertainty about it. There's another question over here which relates. I have a non-Buddhist friend who is to go through, still have to, so many unfortunate experiences. How can I advise her to make peace with uncertainty? With the unfortunate experiences, I call that walking home from this talk this evening and on the way home
because you're not really taking much care where you're walking. You tread in a big pile of dog shit and it goes all over your shoes. That's why the friend has gone through so many unfortunate piles of dog shit. How can I advise her to make peace with such things? It's, this is the contents of the cake you're supposed to make. So what do I mean? Never ever scrape off the dog shit before you get home. Please take it home with you. Don't waste it. And in your home, you may have a garden with an apple tree, pear tree or something. Scrape it off at the root of the apple tree. And one year later, your apples will be sweeter and juicier than ever before. And when you bite into that sweet, juicy apple, and the, the juice goes down your cheek, please remember <coughs> what you're really eating. <laughs> you're eating dog shit transformed into beautiful apple. You can understand that. So that's an example. Yeah, you've been through many unfortunate experiences. You've been in many parts of dog shit. What are you going to do with that? The uncertainty with regard to those experiences is <coughs> how you make use of it. You can actually get very negative, depressed. Why me? Or you can dig it into the garden and grow amazing trees of compassion and wisdom. A whole garden with so many beautiful flowers that you give them to the temple, you give them to your friends. So many incredible delicious fruits you share them with everybody. <coughs> the dukkha, the suffering, is where we learn. It's a fertilizer of compassion and wisdom. Honestly, how can you really have compassion, real understanding, if you haven't really been through it yourself. I can sometimes empathize to a point. Say, a woman has been through an abortion. How can I really, I'm a man, how can I really empathize with that? I can only go so far. But if you've been through that, you can actually put your arm around another woman who's just had an abortion. You don't judge them. The most difficult decision a woman ever makes and basically, men should butt out. They don't know, they can't know why you, why you made the decision to or not to. So, in a case like that, if you've been through it, it's a lot of shit. But at least you know what it is, what it means. And you can actually put your arm around, so I know how you feel. I know I've been there. I know the pain. I know the... the, the un it's un understandable for a man just what it's like to have something growing in your womb and then for one reason or another you decide to abort it. I can't fathom that, I'm not a woman. You can. That's digging in the shit and growing compassion, understanding, wisdom. You can actually do something and help. That's what I mean if you've been through terrible experiences. Please make use of them. Don't throw them away and get negative. It's an amazing opportunity to grow incredible compassion, inspiration and wisdom. So, that's the uncertainty. I don't know how you're going to deal with that, but you have the opportunity <coughs> of dealing with it to the benefit of all sentient beings, or just burying yourself in that shit. That's the uncertainty. Yes, at the back. Uh, I just have a quick question. I could maybe talk about um, the Tenfeta model, but in plain English, what's the form and formless realm? What does it mean in plain English? The form and formless realms, those are what happens when the body vanishes and the mind starts to vanish as well. I, when I was growing up as a, monk, as a lay Buddhist, we didn't have any choice about any tradition. 
I went to see every teacher there was because you didn't have much choice and also just like you know, trying to get some muesli there wasn't any choice in the supermarkets in those days whatever they had you took and I went up to, I went up to Sammy Ling years and years and years ago <coughs> when uh, Akron Rinpoche was still there and I went up to uh, uh, a Zen monastery in Throssel Hall years and years ago and I remember, I didn't know what I was supposed to do they put us all with our eyes open facing a whitewashed wall I was up to anything, I was willing to try anything so, I didn't know what to do but at least I knew how to be peaceful how to not to think and how to be in the moment so when I did that what happened was watching that wall the wall vanished it disappeared, it wasn't there anymore and that was in the late 60s, early 70s, that was cool. Weird was not frightening, weird was cool. So, wow, this is good. But then I thought, why? Why did that happen? The water just vanished. And then it was just basic science. Your brain can only notice things which change. There's a hum in the background, you won't hear it. A feeling in the body which is always there, you won't sense it. Close your eyes, you see the inside of your eyelids after a few seconds you don't see anything at all sight vanishes when it's still same with your computer if you don't click the mouse the screensaver comes on after a few seconds or minutes the screensaver just cuts out no activity means it shuts down that is your brain, that is your senses so what we do in meditation the body shuts down you don't see, you don't hear you don't smell, don't touch, your body vanishes. It's so wonderful, you can't feel anything anymore. Your mind then takes over. The sixth sense. That is what we do in our meditation. Five senses vanish, the sixth sense dominates. And then, the sixth sense, there's nothing much going on, that becomes very still. That starts to disappear. Stage by stage. In, uh, what's it, Alice in Wonderland. Alice sees the Cheshire cat. Comes and then vanishes. Appears and vanishes. And Alice says, This is just so disturbing that you keep vanishing and appearing so quickly. And the Cheshire cat says, Okay, I'll vanish slowly. So the Cheshire cat vanishes tail vanishes, the legs vanish, that's it, and the head I think the ears vanish, the whiskers vanish uh, the head vanishes and then the lips vanish leaving only the smile and Alice says, I've often seen a cat without a smile but this is the first time I've seen a smile without a cat <laughs> that was a good use of English but that reminded me what it's like when things disappear. The smile without the cat is a form of smell. It's at the form now. And as that disappears, you get to the form of smells. The great vanishing act. The art of disappearing. Things which we thought were always there. Vanish. Disappear. Like you watch a lake and the waves on the surface of the lake we think that's coming and going in permanence but then one day you're sitting by the lake and all the water disappears too and the lakes and the mountains surrounding it and the sky above it everything vanishes things which aren't supposed to disappear do vanish the real emptiness disappears vanishing those are the formless and formless, formless experiences in plain Australia. <laughs> yeah, Queen in the back, okay. Okay, we've got time. I only have one last question. So who's going to be the Bodhisattva? Who's going to give up? All the demon up? Great, so that's no last question. It's got to be fair. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, one more, yeah. Put your hand up quickly. Lots of desire. Yes, Craig? Yes? Balance uncertainty with 
learning equanimity. So, for example, I've, I've been sick for a long time, it's been about four years now. I don't know if I'm going to get better or not. You know, it's one of those things. Um, but there's a lot of things that I've had to come to terms with, you know, be kind of try and be economist about with it. And I'm just wondering how you kind of balance those, how you balance the acceptance of what's happening, the uncertainty of whether it might or might not get better, and the equanimity of dealing with actually what you're, what you're going through now. Okay, the equanimity is always about the present moment. Make peace, be kind with it. Just embrace it. What well, you can't, they always, old English saying, if you can't beat it, join it. Uh -huh. Be with it. And you actually find that much of the pain of a sickness is actually the mental pain. I don't want this. It's a tough one to say, but if you say, can't do anything about it, I'm going to be with this. It actually changes the whole experience. So Buddha's saying two hours, two thoughts, the mental and the physical. Physical, you can't do too much about the mental, how you accept it or don't accept it, you can do a lot there. So, you be with it. The worst part of the pain is, I can't stand this any longer, it's too much. You're off in the future, projecting. This is going to last for a long time, and I just can't handle that. The uncertainty is you don't know if it's going to last for a long time. I've had so many experiences, anecdotal myself and with others, of things not going according to the way the doctors predict. Totally uncertain. You never know what's going to happen next. The head of the medical school at St. Vincent <coughs> Hospital in Sydney, I got this from one of his um, um, doctors, he welcomed the new intake of medical students with the memorable words, 50% of what we're going to teach you in the next four years is wrong. My problem is I do not know which 50% it is. <laughs> now that to me is a scientist. Work in progress, not certain at all. Because we just do not know. And if you do know, then you make what you expect. So that, amazing. One day you wake up and the sickness is gone. Why? So much about your body, about karma, you just don't know. So, you have this amazing thing called hope. Don't worry, be hopey. <laughs> okay, one more. Okay, very quick, good. Um, I started to do yoga meditation a long time ago, and two years ago I came to London and I met a friend. And this friend uh, looked like stressed, and she complained, and one day we were watching some of your video, and after watching some of your video, uh, we were discussing at the end. Yeah. And she said, uh, no, but you know, this looks interesting, and then, uh, but uh, for me it's difficult to apply this, because I have uh, my uh, invoice to pay, I have a stressful job, and I am here in London, just in a small room. <coughs> so, this, if I live like a monk, it's maybe easy to apply, but uh, I don't... I don't see how to apply this uh, in my normal life, and I didn't know what to answer. The answer is so simple. Please ask me what I do every day. I run four or five monasteries. I call them my franchises. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to decide how we can raise enough money for, an, for an Bikuni Monastery and pay for looking after a nun. They're very cheap to look after. <laughs> But sometimes there's not enough funds to look after them, you know, to get the fares and just to get the medicines you need, some iron tablets or something, and don't have money ourselves. And I have to look after that. I work. Look, if you actually ask any of the monks who live with me, or any other people, how much work I do, they can't believe just how much I do. So a monk is not, I wish it was like you thought. Where you could just live in your cave and just you know, really sit on your bum all the time. That would be lovely, that's my fantasy. But the real world is, I've got to work like a dog. 
There's many similarities. Dogs eat out of bowls, so do I. They live in little kennels, I live in caves. Dogs, they just take the master out for a walk and wag its tail. And that's what I have to do. Have my photograph taken and smile. So I'm the walk. That's my job. <laughs> out of kindness, that's what a dog teaches. Compassion and kindness. But dogs never complain, neither do I, except now. <laughs> so actually you work very hard and that's one of the reasons why I know what it feels like. I, I'm a CEM, Chief Executive Monk. <laughs> so yeah, I've, I've got a little tablet over there, I've been afraid to open up and find out which goes on. You know, sometimes monks go sick, sometimes they go crazy, sometimes the committee goes crazy. Sometimes things fall on the ground when you're trying to give a talk. <laughs> and just, life is like that. There's so many things to organise and have to look after. It's only a small monastery, so I look after in Australia. The Monks Monastery, what is it now? 390 acres to look after with 24 monks. And lots of people wanted to become monks. A huge community. I got my retreat centre, five million dollar retreat centre. You always look after it, solve problems. We have a, a five, I think it's a very small Bikuni monastery, 583 acres to look after. And what else we have? All these other monasteries, building another uh, joint monastery, Bikunis and Bikus, just south of Melbourne. And what else am I doing? Oh yeah, looking after a Cambodian Buddhist group because they got into big debt. So. I use my disciples to pay off their debt. And what else am I doing? Um, looking after uh, the Brahm Center in Singapore and the Buddhist Fellowship in Singapore, which I usually look after and teach at, and the Brahm, Educa no, the Brahm Education Center in Singapore. You can understand where that came from, Brahm Education Center. The Brahm, what's it, um, uh, where is she? Uh, her brother, Meta Rihari. That's the, the Brahm Society in Colombo. That's what he calls it. That's her brother runs that. The under the Ajahn Brahm Society. So that's another franchise in Colombo which her brother is running. And what else do I do? Oh yeah, Ahi Pasiko Foundation in um, where is it? Over in um, Indonesia. The BIF. I don't know why they called it BIF. That's um, uh, Bodhinyana International Foundation over in Hong Kong. Trying to on the the founding president of the Australia Sangha Association tried to get all the Sangha, different traditions all together to actually to do something. Just like with the problems in Myanmar. To have a joint statement, we can give it to the government, protect you know, the temples, to say Buddhists are actually doing something. Not just sitting there, sort of, saying, oh, this shouldn't happen, oh, we shouldn't do this, oh, this is wrong, or whatever. There are people who are homeless in uh, Bangladesh right now. We haven't got enough food. We're really struggling. And so the Buddhists, basically, yeah, that's another problem, how they got to be like that, and who's responsible, but right now, they need food and shelter. So it's only a small amount, but I managed to raise $6,000 just before I left. To send over there, find out exactly where you can send it, so you know it's going to get there to the people who need. That's also the things I do. So it's not really much. <laughs> how to deal with it, yeah. So that's actually understanding how you deal with it. Quick story, it's in one of the books, pushing wheelbarrows from my master, Rajat Chah. After six days of hard work, they couldn't decide where they wanted this blooming earth. One said put it over there, put it over there. Three days of really hard work. The other one said put it over there, so we moved it back again. You know what masters are like? And one master says one thing, one master says the other thing. I don't care, as long as you agree, because I'm the one who has to do the work. So, after six days I lost my faith in Ajahn Chah and everyone else. I never became a monk to push wheelbarrows of earth all day in the jungles, being bitten by mosquitoes on one meal a day. Malnourished, abused, I wish I had a union. <laughs> but we didn't. But one of the monks, they saw me. I was angry, I was upset, disappointed, frustrated, just being, being exploited. And he came up to me, he said something which I'm sharing with you now. He said, 
Pushing a wheelbarrow is easy. Thinking about it is the hard part. And that has changed the whole perception. Whatever you have to do in life, sir, and no matter how much business it is, doing it is the easy part. Thinking about it is the difficult part. So that's what I learned how to do. Building nuts monastery is easy when you don't think about it. It just happens. Giving a talk, easy. Don't think about it. Dying is easy when you don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the trick. We worry so much, we think so much, we don't sleep, lose our energies, lose our positivity, we think too much, which destroys our effectiveness. Ta da! Okay, ring the gong. Yes, there it goes. Excellent. So, hope you enjoyed that. Remember to do everything you've got. Come on! Okay, enough. <laughs> all the best. See you next time. Very good. <laughs> and all the best. Bye bye. And I always say, don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs>